I'm Greek that looks thoroughly Pakistani. Yeah. I yeah. was born in Britain, but my parents are Greek. My dad was born in Athens. What the, the unique thing about youth club is, we usually say this, keep on saying, is like, like a bouquet. Yeah. Each flower. Uh, They're all great brothers yeah, as well. Mashallah. I've met them. May Allah and, save us. When I went to the elite universities, he went to Lums, went to this place, that place. I noticed there was even an increased effort to liberalize and secularize and damage the hearts and minds of middle class and elite students. Mm. We actually covered more than 500 plus uh, universities and colleges all over wow. Pakistan last year. This time is, we plan to go bigger, wow. inshallah. Hey, shall we start? We've already started. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can't just throw me in like that. <laughs> <laughs> What did these guys do? That was such a Pakistani move. That was brilliant. <laughs> no, Life? No, no, no. <laughs> That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Ooh. We're not live. We're not live. And there were three main reasons why I became Muslim. I was convinced with the kind of intellectual foundations of Islam. Mm. I had an affinity for some Islamic values or how they were expressed and manifested mm. by my Muslim friends. Mm. The brotherhood. There was a sense of love and connection between the Muslim brothers, mm. even though they had different demographic and ethnic backgrounds. Mm. The closest you are to your Lord is in Sajda. So speak to him. I remember once I was praying and I spoke to Allah in Sajda and I said, I need guidance. And then two weeks after that, I became Muslim. Mm. Think yeah, about Rumble because one them, brother, yeah. some brother who's been coming up on YouTube recently, very articulate. He's like the white Malcolm X. What's the guy? I forgot his name, but he's been coming. He's been banned. TikTok gone, YouTube gone. Yeah, a religious speaker? Yeah. I'm not aware of him. Uh, I'll show you his name, but he's mm. been banned. Okay. So what I, yeah, so we need to make our own platform. The only problem is when you make your own platforms, it's an echo chamber. Mm. You're only speaking to your own audiences, which is fine. Mm. You still need that. But it's harder to reach out to other audiences. True. To be able to redirect your content to a uh, new audience. Yeah, that's the problem. Uh, what we planning actually? Or use Twitter. Twitter has videos now, lengthy. You could put three-hour videos on. Yeah. There. So uh, start building on Twitter. Hmm. I might do that actually. I'm actually I've, I've had my Twitter account since 2009. I've recently gotten like uh, active on it. You 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 haven't used it for a long I time. I haven't been using it. It's actually quite cool. It's, it's the most used app. Yeah, I know. I know. Use it, use it. Like, How many followers do you have? Uh, right, currently, uh, I received a blue tick and uh, I think it's around around 17k. So okay, good. Uh, enough. I'm I'm haven't been am active. I following you? Huh? Am I following you? I think you are. Okay, I'll retweet your stuff. I think. Because we need to get you guys and big uh, on it. Even Zyaba is not active on Twitter. He should because Twitter is, is, is kind of used by all demographics, do you see? Mm. So YouTube is like 18 to 35. Twitter is everybody. Hmm. Actually, um, personally, uh, although my media team keep asking me about it, but we are not active on social media. I purposely try not to be able to be there. Personally, myself, they put my content over there. Uh, reason being that I used to earlier make war blogs and everything, and your mindset actually, you know, okay, fine. Post, yeah, vlogs is too much. Yeah. It takes me. A I, even I hardly post. Yeah. Like my last video was like maybe three weeks ago. Hmm. I don't want to be a slave to the algorithm, bro. Yeah. I already coined the it term. It takes it all on. I've coined, you, you I've, on TikTok. I've coined the term. It's called yeah. algorithm prostitution. Yeah, I, 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 I don't want to be that. Yeah. Because it's going to consume you. Mm. And uh, I, not I, sorry, Ria, yeah. Kibber, True. True. Ojob, yeah. Vanity, it's going to mess you up. I have around uh, 104K plus uh, followers on Instagram. Brilliant. So uh, most of my students, my university students, they like, actively following on that platform but uh, Zerin keeps telling me to put something out there maybe you go for a workout I've tried doing that but I'm not very consistent it's like I just can't end up doing now, it you know what you should do I'm going to do this actually yeah. as well maybe we could do it together It'd yeah be really sure. cool so did you see the boxing bag yeah so yeah <laughs> salivating <laughs> so um a lot of brothers who do training clips they're actually not very good yeah I'm, I'm with all due respect to and uh if a Muslim speaker is going to do a training clip, he should be, he should do it well. Mm. And if what you should do is just do one, mm. but do a good training montage. Yeah. And it's always there. People, mm. it will go viral. Yeah. And in that, put, do some nasiha in between sets, in between uh, rounds. Mm. Do a nice nasiha at the end, and that's your thing. So they mm. know you're a man, you're strong, you're powerful. You don't have to do it all the time. Yeah. 
but do one good yeah. one. So that's what I'm tr- going to try and do one day. Mm. <laughs> do a good training montage. You know? Yeah. Um, I think you should do it. Obviously, prefer intention this, that, and the other. But do it because people want to see uh, practicing brothers who are masculine. Mm. They're strong. They're also spiritual, and they, mm. they get emotional for the right reasons, and so on and so forth. My uh, students actually. So you do a podcast. Why don't you invite? The girls will be like, oh, no, not him. We hate him. And you know, the kids like are listening to him like anything. They're talking about Bugatti. And it's like, you know, you guys are like. That's why tra- people like you need to do training montages. But the thing is, that's why people like you need to actually fill that space. Hmm. It's a hard space to fill, hmm. but you should fill it 100%. Um, because otherwise, other guys are going to be filling it. They're eloquent. They're loud, they're strong. And then they, may, they, they still haven't regretted like their past crimes. Mm. They talk about body counts. They say that women, yeah. men should have many seat with you know, promoting zina basically. Yeah. What kind of nonsense is this? I, I want to talk to you about this, Elevan. I want to highlight this because, you know, you uh, move around, you travel, you do understand the very idea that how important it is for us to be able to make these montages and everything. Uh, youth club gets a lot of backlash regarding this. By whom? By local scholars. And this is one of the things, if we, because we do understand how the, the algorithm works. Uh, if we show them the very idea of how we are in our personal life and not just giving lectures, uh, we're not just some robot behind our Instagram accounts. Uh, we are real individuals who do the regular stuff that we do. We ride our bikes, we work out, or we come from families who are actually are not dependent on uh, other people. And uh, we actually get accused of being able to show a lot of materialism. Okay? Although uh, in terms of Lahore, and Islamabad and Karachi, you see there's a lot of difference uh, in terms of how we be able to do so. So like, uh, uh, how important do you think this needs to be done in order to be able to do that? And where do you draw the line? In terms of uh, a lot of people go overboard, it actually goes to a point where they, they actually, you know, you don't even realize that I've seen it with myself. My namaz, my khushu is going to be affecting. Okay, fine. This is actually working now. Even if you don't want to. Okay, my, I was able to reach out to a lot of audience because I was act, I actually made a workout video of my own. Uh, I actually made it through my mobile. We didn't have even uh, the equipment back then. Uh, but I, I strongly feel there has to be a balance. Yes, we agree to that. But a lot of people still don't understand the importance of it. They, they actually say that, you know, uh, if you, you seen doing that, uh, there has to be some uh, in bad intention uh, behind it. So how? Yeah, impo- well, that's not necessarily true because we are inspired by the life of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu mm. an for many reasons, for his size, strength, you know, even the way that he physically manhandled other Sahaba and yeah. corrected them. And yeah. This is like an insight to his life. Mm. That's why we love the Sahaba because we have insights to their life that we wouldn't have normally. Mm. If it was all about preaching and talking, even in the Prophet Sallam, we have insights to his life in that way. The way he dealt with his wives and so on and so forth. His wrestling match that he mm. had and the person became Muslim. Yani, this is an insight to a real life. Mm. And I don't know how to answer the question, by the way, because I need to think about it. But mm. what I would say is, if you think about um, some of the speakers who are very squeaky clean, mm. the majority of the followers are women. Mm. <laughs> or... Effeminate men yeah. <laughs> With all due respect And we don't want that And we we know yeah. Like there's one speaker I don't want to mention his name He looks like he just came back from, He came from the heavens He's an angel He has He doesn't smell He doesn't go to the toilet He he doesn't even need to do Istighfar Because he's perfect That's how he looks And as a man I'm like With all due respect I, I'm i not going to have you On the front line with me I, I, I'm i not Yanni I won't trust your abilities Because you just look too Yanni Not to say that's the case But that's how he comes across Yeah and his following is on YouTube around, I think, 55% women, okay. which is unbelievable for YouTube. It's unbelievable mm. because YouTube is a 95% male dominated yeah. platform. Yeah. So these are not the people that we want to shape. Yeah. Mm. So I, I would say get people insights into your life. Mm. Have Shura though, consult. Have the naysayers as well mm. as part of the Shura because naysayers are very important to a degree. Mm. Because they unveil blind spots for you and you understand, okay, maybe there was too much Riyah here. Maybe mm. there was too much, I came across as Mutakabbir maybe, or that I didn't intend it. So mm. you could, you should have that sure process. But I don't think you should not do it. Mm. I don't have an answer, but mm. I, I do think you should definitely mm. do it. And especially, how old are you? 
I'm actually turning 43. Mashallah, Allah bless you. So this month? Uh, December. Mashallah, good. So we're similar age. So I'm 43 this month. Actually, you're also 43. Yeah, yeah, oh, mashallah. So um, 43 on the 21st of this month. Yeah. Oh, mashallah, mashallah, yeah, yeah. mashallah. So um, now is the age for you to make an impact. Now, yeah. if that's why I'm speaking to you like this in mm. a way, retrospectively. Yeah? If you were 20 or 30, I may not give you that advice. But because you're 40, you're like, you've gone beyond the age of, I just want to showcase myself mm. and I am mm. somebody... Because when you reach 40s, you start to mm. get that. You're mid 30s, you start to have a little bit more of a refined mm. understanding. Not because mm. you're someone special, just because of age. Yeah. And there's a there's a connection between hikmah mm. and age anyway, as per the hadith of Prophet mm. So this is the time, you know? Because don't forget, a lot of the 40 and 50 year olds in the non-Muslim mm. space, they're big, they're jacked, they're articulate, they're intelligent, mm. they lead like Joe Rogan mm. and other people who have, even Andrew Huberman, he's quite mm. strong. They're... Late their forties, fifties mm. guys. Mm. They've lived the life. They've got experience. They've got something to share, mm. and they have a sense of maturity that they're not going to mm. be like twenty and mm. thirty year olds are showing off. Mm. Now's the time. I, I Don't waste it. You're forty three because after like maybe fifty, you yeah. get more slower or yeah. sixty. Now showcase mm. stuff now. Mm. I think for and just have the right target and intention because you don't want to lose the sisters true. as well. You don't want to yeah. lose the, the the brothers who may not yeah. be interested because remember this: Islamic masculinity is not about temperament yeah do you see because some people think temperament is masculine no mm. you may be an alpha male and loud but you may be a coward true and the first time i said if you're a coward and stingy you're not a man okay do you see my mm, point yeah so temperament is different and the sahaba had different mm. temperaments mm. even if someone's really soft and meek it doesn't mean they're not a man mm. they could have rujula masculinity mm. as long as they're not cowards mm. and they're not stingy mm. and there's other things to add as well but that's mm. the kind of essential element so I think um, uh, youngsters coming in the field of dawa today are more in danger. Yeah, I think to, we've warmed up to what we start. Back in the days, like I actually changed in 2003-2004. So I was coming from a, a fashion background. Oh, really? So, and I was a so. musician myself. So being on stage, uh, fashion shows, uh, being part of the circle... I think uh, personally, for me, that element of attention got fed over there to a huge degree. And when I got tired of all that hush hush being in the, you know, the circle of being, being crazy or parties and everything, uh, I just wanted to get out. And uh, although it's like something, it's, it's, it's like in on you, 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 you like some people appreciating you, you know, that's the element. Yeah, of like, course, yes. You, you, you like uh, being able to get that attention, but you have to be co- able to constantly fight that. But what I, I strongly feel like as compared to the current generation now and the, how the youngsters are looking and how we get uh, constantly uh, criticized for motivating young speakers uh, with bikes or be able to have podcasts who can afford to be able to have a, uh, uh, podcast mic they're coming online and it's like you don't now look what youth club is doing they're actually motivating a lot of foolish uh you know not even having yeah proper so you should sign-up. you should articulate criteria in place before people start to do anything mm. yeah and that's the reason why we have a very strict criteria for being a speaker mm. if anybody wants to be a speaker we want to make them a speaker wow and uh, the other thing is they have to be able to have certain level of knowledge to be able to constantly be uh, around scholars and uh, we, uh, because everybody wants to be a speaker, everybody now wants to be because the social media is making it like crazy out there. And uh, even the youngsters who have been able to get a little bit of exposure start getting those DMs and uh, from practicing sisters because the market is true. Yeah, so for, we have a code of conduct yeah. policy, and in there, we have something like if a speaker has social media, someone mm. has, have, has to have access to his yeah. DMs. Mm. Otherwise, yeah. <laughs> you're going to open the door to so much nonsense. Yeah, true. Hey, shall we start? We've already started. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. You didn't realize, right? <laughs> you, you, I, we told you that it's going to be organic. <laughs> yeah, but I, you can't, but I said some things I may not want to be done publicly. You can't do that. that <laughs> yeah. I had a kind of feeling towards the end. Yeah. Is Because the way I noticed, by the way, you are holding the mic. I'm yeah. Thinking, okay. <laughs> There's something going on here. No, no, no. We can't do that, bro. You can't just throw me in like that. <laughs> what did these guys do? See, that's the whole thing. That we start the podcast in such a natural way that you don't. You, you, you're actually having a conversation. No, I, with I, me. I, I, I'm usually organic anyway. But yeah. we, oh my god! Shall we just restart? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> These guys, man, that was such a Pakistani move. That was brilliant. That was brilliant. No, 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 no. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Ooh. We're not live. We're not live. <laughs> Uh, a lot of people actually start their podcast like okay fine welcome back to our show yeah that's Today. what I was kind of yeah. waiting for so we don't do that uh, it just goes online because that's the hook that's where people actually feel that they're actually listening to a, a organic conversation yeah you know for yeah. sure speaking about changing your lifestyle yes uh, I've never been able to hear your uh, story of conversion oh right yes so how did you come to Islam when was it what made you and uh, so I became Muslim in 2002 2002 so that's nearly 21 years ago okay 2002 October the 5th alhamdulillah and there were three main reasons why I became Muslim reason number one was I was convinced with the kind of intellectual foundations of Islam mm. namely God exists and that the Quran is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the other reason was I had an affinity for some Islamic values or how they were expressed and manifested mm. by my Muslim friends. Mm. And the other one was the brotherhood. There was a sense of love and connection between the Muslim brothers, mm. even though they had different demographic and ethnic backgrounds. Mm. Uh, sorry to cut you off. Yeah, uh, no a problem. lot of my audience may not be fully aware of it. So I would just want you to be able to, uh, you know, clarify to them uh, which religion did you belong to and uh, oh, yes. like the, the family background where you actually okay, from. Good. Yeah, so like, yeah. I'm Greek that looks thoroughly Pakistani. Yeah, I yeah. was born in Britain, but my parents are Greek. My dad was born in Athens. Okay. My mom was, is still a Greek Cypriot. So she comes from Cyprus, which is an island, it's the mm -hmm. Republic of Cyprus. She came to the UK as a result of the Turkish Cypriot conflict in 1974. Okay. So she came in 1975. Mm. She's officially a refugee. My mom is a refugee. Mm. My dad came in the 70s as well. So I come from that background. In terms of religious, religious, religiosity, I wouldn't consider myself as a, being brought up as a religious person, but we had a father who was, you know, he loved Jesus, Jesus, the statements of Jesus, Isa alayhi salam. And, but he didn't like dogma, he didn't like religion. Mm. And he was almost like a new age spiritualist to a certain degree, with kind of compassionate or humanistic type values. So I was brought up like that. I kind of believed in God to a certain degree. Mm. It was always in the back of my mind. So I, w I wasn't someone who was an atheist. I wouldn't describe myself as mm. that. But I wouldn't even describe myself as a Christian either. Okay. But I came from a Greek background, but not a very cultural Greek mm. background because my dad was kind of, he felt that lines on a map were human constructs. Mm. Although I had an appreciation for Greek food, Greek literature, I went to Greek schools on Sat I went to Greek school on Saturdays, Greek dancing, <laughs> okay. the language, the way you express yourself, mm. some of the Greek humor. I heard it's similar to Punjabi humor, which okay. is not a good thing. Right. <laughs> it's very, very vile. Yeah. So like the Greeks are the Punjabis of Europe. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> Alas, they're the Punjabis of Europe. So, you know, Greeks are interesting people, you know, I think the Greeks are, their heart is in the East hmm. and the mind is in the West. Hmm. That's probably the easiest way to describe the Greek mentality. Somehow the, the other the Greek, the Greek way of being. Someone told me that my ancestors were from, uh, like, from the Greek background. Yeah, most likely. Yeah, could most be. likely. Yeah, it could be. So, Alhamdulillah, we're like blood brothers, bro. Blood brothers. <laughs> <laughs> so, so from that perspective, I, it was a very unique environment because I was brought up vegetarian or pescatarian. We'll eat okay. no meat but fish, hmm. because my dad felt that you know Jesus, his com his companions or his disciples hmm. were fishermen. They weren't butchers. Okay, and I don't know, he had other views concerning animals and which is very rare for Greeks, right? To be brought up like quasi-vegetarian or pescatarian. Mm. So we had this type of upbringing. It was quasi-spiritual, compassion, love at home, mm. not religious, but believe in spirituality, but also believe in kind of self-help. Like my dad had books like The Power of Positive Thinking, mm. books on mysticism, 
the books, you know, the science of the mind. So we were brought up in that kind of environment, but we were also brought up in my dad's journey. Mm. Because my dad is not the same person he was 20 years ago. He's not the same person he was 40 years ago. So you we would see an evolution of my father and we were basically I'm using the word victims in a nice way, not a bad way. We were victims of his evolution, yeah. Mm. Or we were, we were we we were impacted by different stages of of his evolution. Which in some cases was very powerful because you saw change and you mm. saw positive change mm. and that inspires you, doesn't it? Even for someone who is 40s, 50s, 60s, still developing in, to a certain degree. But also at the same time, there is a sense of negativity. There's pros and cons to nearly mm. most things, which is, you know, maybe we didn't get spiritual stability mm. or a, a, a worldview that is stable at home. There were some essential elements like caring for each other, loving for each other, each other and so on and so forth. But when you see someone going through that existential journey or that spiritual journey and you see different phases in his life, yes, it could be very inspirational. Yes, it would touch, move and inspire you. But at the same time, maybe growing up, maybe, and I'm just thinking aloud here, mm. maybe I needed a little bit more stability, <laughs> especially for someone like me. <laughs> so, so was this uh, idea... Because I was a naughty boy as well. Who do you, did you interact with or be able to uh, get inspired or be get able to have that exposure regarding Islam? So the first exposure I had about Islam, you know, my memory is very bad and which is a good thing mm. because Mike Tyson said that a key to a good marriage is a bad memory. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I don't remember. I oh, know. you did this. I don't remember. Ah, just forgive me. I have no idea. <laughs> so um, from what I remember, from what I can recall, my first interaction with Muslims was actually, in terms of direct interaction, mm. was at school. Mm. Maybe primary school, which for those who don't know, is like from the ages of 5 to 11. Mm. And then at, at secondary school, especially secondary school, so one of my close friends, Moin Al Ahmed, he was a Muslim and he was practicing Muslim. He would pray, he would mm. not really shake hands with women from what I remember. He wouldn't even touch alcohol in science in the classes, right? He was, you know, he had, he honored women and he had a different disposition about him. And there were others as well. And I remember I prayed my first Juma. I wasn't a Muslim at secondary school because my friends were Muslim. I had a friend who was half Indian, half Chinese, Malay. I think his father used to be one of the pilots, uh, either, either fighter pilot for Pakistan or one of the airline pilots. Mm. And they used to express the Islam and talk about the deen and, you know, Ramadan and stuff like that. So that was my first type of interaction. Also, I had the Turkish friends as well, which generally speaking, the Turks in my area were a little bit more secular. But they still had a love for the deen, some of them. They still had an appreciation. I remember the first time I actually heard the translation of the Quran was with my Turkish friend, Sihan, known as Jihan in, in Turkish language. And he had a computer, he was very into IT. He was a... No, he wasn't a nerd, but you can call him a computer nerd from mm. his desire to learn about IT and computers. He was one of the first guys, I think, who had, you know, one of the new computers of the time, which was in the 90s. Yeah. And I remember, I think he was watching the message. Okay. And then there was a part that recites the Quran in English and it so talks about, no, it wasn't so Maryam, it was... I don't remember the movie, the surah actually. that mentions about burying the daughters alive for what sin? Uh -huh. Yes, the ayyaz and minhaj. Yes, yeah. and it was very powerful, and I could see he had a sense of hmm. depth. Not, yeah, it, 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 it connected with something deep inside him, and I and I felt that. I don't think at the time I even knew it was Quran. Hmm. It was, but that was the first time I engaged with the Quran in the English language. What else? But then as I started developing and growing, my brother had a friend called Joinul or Zainal Abedin. He was with Tablik Jama, practicing brother. He was very cool as well, by the way. Like he would, he bought this 1970s 
I think it was a seven liter Mustang or whatever it was. I'm not good with the car, so I do apologize. But every time he drove it, it sounded like it was a helicopter landing somewhere. Yeah? And you see this guy, big guy, big beard, maybe Topi, Thobe, and he's driving this thing. Yeah. So he had this quirkiness about him, this coolness about him. And actually, I think I remember my father said that if he trusts anyone to be upstairs with my sister, because he used to come to the house and stuff, he would trust him mm. because he had that kind of piety about him. Yeah. So he would like talk about Islam, especially to my brother and to myself. And I remember once he said in the living room, because we were talking about something political, I think. He was like, look, we don't do things for you. We do things for God. And that really disturbed me. I, f I think I went to the toilet and I felt a bit sick. <laughs> now it's one of the most profound things. That you yeah. don't do things for your ego. You mm. do it for the higher power. Mm. This, is, this is fantastic, you know, for the sake of Allah. Because, mm. you know, he's worthy of these acts of worship because you love him. Because he's worthy of the act by of that the act of worship by virtue of who he is. He's worthy of extensive praise and gratitude by virtue of his names and attributes. Mm. You know, you want his divine reward. You want to shield yourself from the consequences of of removing yourself away from his mercy, which is the nar, the fire. These are profound concepts, mm. right? Because the ego is one of the the enemies of humanity, and most people do things for the ego. True. Yeah. But I didn't get that, mm. but that was good medicine for me. Even one small statement like that had a, quite a bit of an impact on me. Yeah? Mm. We don't do things for you, we do things for God. I'm like, whoa, you know, it's like, I didn't know how to register it. I think it did affect my ego to some yeah. degree. It was like, it, it felt like almost a sense of, I don't even know how to describe it, to be honest. But yeah, so that was an interaction. And then moving on, my friend Moino will give me this, pamphlet or booklet called faith in progress that was really kind of just rational it talked about the dependency argument why god exists it talked about the inimitability of the quran and i found the way it was written it mm. was quite convincing at that time and it really retrospectively speaking i think it just uh, unclouded my fitrah mm. yeah because now when i see those arguments i may want to improve them <laughs> yeah or maybe i have written about them in ways that are different from that booklet but the mm. point is something happened to my fitra yeah so you... and it awakened something within and i got a sense of conviction about the, the deen but that wasn't enough mm. i needed something else you see because human beings are not ai machines you don't just type in a code an algorithm expecting certain results human beings are far more complicated than that as you know from an Islamic psychological perspective, but also from a cognitive science perspective. Mm. Cognitive science now agrees that you may think you're rational, but actually your rationality is dictated by psycho-emotive forces, yeah? So, you know, the human being is not just an aql. In actual fact, the aql is a, is a function of the qalb, according mm. to the majority of the ulama, and the qalb does taqallub, mm. right? The qalb does taqallub, it wavers. Mm. And there are fitan of the qalb, such as shahawat and shubahat, blame with the desires, destructive doubts. There are diseases like ujub, mm. vanity, hasad, blame with the jealousy, kibr, ego, arrogance, and riya, ostentation. So the, the aql, the intellect, is a function of this thing that wavers, has diseases, and has these fitan, <laughs> mm. right? So just engaging with the aql is not enough. Because if the heart is messed up, then the aql is not going to function properly anyway. True. So... I need something else. So I read this book. I was reading this book. I think it's called Islam in Focus. I think it's written by an Egyptian scholar. Mm -hmm. It's an old book. And in that, it taught you how to pray. It taught you how to, you know, memorize some surahs, some chapters of the Quran. So I memorized Surah Al-Fatiha. I memorized Surah Ikhlas. Before I became Muslim, I learned how to pray, to do wudu. And I used to pray. Mm -hmm. So I used to actually pray relatively regularly, not five times a day, mm. but I'll go to like a Turkish mosque, I'll pray with some of my Muslim friends, I'll go to the Markas, uh, Tablik Jama used to have something in East mm. London every Thursdays, I believe. So how did you say your Shahada? Like, what, do you still remember the experience or how? Well, this is pray? before my Shahada, by the way. Okay. Yeah, so I was praying before I became Muslim. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Actually. So I, I was praying before I became Muslim and that helped me. So that whole experience helped me. I remember one of my brother's friends, his name is uh, Amir Islahi, he's a doctor, a very, very beautiful brother, which I need to meet very soon. And he is a wrestler as well. I think he used to train with the British wrestlers. He's got a 
gym in London called Legion Fitness, I believe. Okay. It's a great brother, proper, proper real man, you know, mm. masculine person. You know, he's got the emotional side, the spiritual side, but also the masculine side on mm. his women. He could defend himself. He's a monster, but he could control that as well. You know, he's an inspiration. Anyways, I remember him saying before I was Muslim in my college, he was speaking to some of the, my Muslim friends saying, the closest you are to your Lord is in Sajda. So speak to him. And I remember once I was praying. So, and I spoke to Allah in Sajda and I said, I need guidance. And then two weeks after that, I became Muslim, I think. Alhamdulillah. So, that was my kind of experiences with the Muslims, the Salah, the intellectual stuff. Obviously, there's much more to say because it was like a whole life, not a whole mm -hmm. life, but it was over a period of, you know, maybe years. But those are kind of key moments that I can remember for now. Mm -hmm. And yeah, those are the main the, the main aspects of the story, really. I was engaged with, with Muslims through relationships, through friends and through reading. And through even asking questions and interacting and being engaged with Pakistanis, Bengalis, Turks, a whole spectrum of different Muslims from different backgrounds, different perspectives, different ethnicities, even different demographics. And that was the beautiful thing of living in London, especially in the London bor borough of Hackney, because it shapes you because you're able to interact with all of these people. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that, that was the kind of, that's not the whole story, but mm -hmm. that's key parts of the story. And I think that's like that's a beautiful uh, journey, and I've uh, as many people I've interacted with, uh, it's amazing to know that every single one of them have their journey, which was basically it feels as if it was customized for them. Uh, if I talk about myself, if I talk about any of my brothers who are active in the field of dawah, I've interacted with people who have been coming from abroad. It's like you know you return back to your fitra in the most beautiful way possible yes and uh, one of the things that i've seen is basically which is common is the disappointment from this world and uh, the more you were attached or clinged on to the whole idea of this world being more important actually loses its essence in front of you slowly slowly and you realize that you know it's it's not meant to be there and uh, but in any case i'll just ask you uh, one question like in this whole journey of scholarship, uh, being able to learn Islam, being able to be uh, involved in the field of Dawah, who inspired you? Who, who allowed you to be able to uh, yes. take this journey? So before I get into that, I, what you just said now really shook me. <clears throat> in terms of disappointment. <clears throat> now, obviously, this is not a traumatic story, but there was a time when I was around 11, 12, 13 mm -hmm. years old. I lost the sense of material things weren't that very important because I was brought up like that anyway. Like when people talk to me about cars, I'm not a car guy mm. and stuff like that. So my dad was kind of, he lived a life as if he never feared poverty, really. Mm. <laughs> like he would give, he'd always want to spend, he, he wasn't into material stuff. Maybe sometimes it was to, to his detriment as well. Mm. But anyway, the point is, there was a time when I was used to sit in the bath. I, I love baths, by the way. So I'm an ambivert, yeah. I think I am. So when I'm on stage, I'm extroverted. And then I want to go home, sit in a bath, yeah. Don't get me wrong, I can turn it on and, you know, be with the friends and true, the brothers. But if, if I had a preference, maybe I'll sit in the bath for two hours, yeah. yeah. So I used to sit in the bath as a kid, mm. like I do now. And something hit me. It was like a form of solipsism which was, hold on a second, I am only aware of my conscious experience at this moment. No one else is aware of my conscious experience at this, of this moment. I'm not aware of the conscious experiences of my loved ones and my friends in this moment. And that just gave me a profound sense of loneliness, profound, as if everyone else wasn't real. Because real was to experience, mm. real was to feel what they feel in some kind of weird, bizarre sense in a conscious way. And that just, for some reason, I can't rationalize it, just gave me a huge sense of loneliness in a way. Mm. Or that everything else was somewhat meaningless because I'm seeing it through my, everything is through my own perspective. Now, if you think about that, that actually 
that's actually quite lonely, right? <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, because hmm. you don't have everybody else's perspectives. You're not, like, fe- I'm not feeling what you're feeling. And that's why maybe I love talking about the hard problem of consciousness because it's there's a there's a child traumatic experience or whatever mm. you want to call mm. it. It's not traumatic, but it hit me. I used to cry, I think. I, I used to feel lonely. Mm. And I think that drove me to have a sense of meaning because meaning for me is powerful. If you could give me all the houses in the world, bro, if there's no meaning behind it, I'm sorry, it doesn't mean anything to me. Mm. It doesn't. Like, I'm not saying I'm pious. It's not. It's just the mm. way I was constructed from my True. experience. Mm. You, I may enjoy it for five minutes, but then I'm like, this is meaningless. This is bagwas. <laughs> my, my, in my journey, uh, for whatever it is, it's not something uh, amazing in terms of being able to share as a story. But my most beautiful moments have been when I was alone. In terms of uh, sadness, I waited for something my, for a long period of time. And I allowed myself to be able to discard all choices. And when I finally got, got that thing, it disappointed me. It's power. And like Allah SWT says in the Quran, Da'afu Talibu wal Matloob, everyone is weak. The one you're asking, the one that, who's asking, they're all weak. I realized from that very moment and that what that person said to me, that God will give you something better in return. And I just did not get something better in turn. I got God so, as a return. And I realized this journey that what I want cannot be filled by what I wanted from this world. Mm. And the best thing Allah SWT gave me in that journey was being able to be alone. I left my car, be able to I used to just go out alone. I used to stay awake, be able to read those books. And I realized how essential that pain was for me to be able to have that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because my entire youth, when I was in school, when I was in college, it was all about being around noise. And I, I clearly remember I was, it was, I think it was 3 or 4 a.m. in the morning. I was in the middle of a very hop notch party. And I was sitting in one corner. I did not realize why this entire environment was just suffocating for me. And I started crying right in the corner. I was crying in the corner. I was like, Allah, forgive me and forgive them. For they do not know. And uh, I don't know how we're wasting our youth. And the one thing that that loneliness allowed me is to be able to just get up from my university cafeteria environment. And my female friends were asking me, what? And that's the point I'm coming to because people, when they, uh, they they just become all depressive because of the fact that they're too alone, that is the time when they have to be able to build their relationship with Allah SWT. And I used to just go in that quiet uh, musalla, which was not even a masjid, and I just used to be able to uh, run towards it, be able to read the translation of the Quran. I did not, you know, I was, I was like seriously weak in Urdu. So, because I come from a Zoraistic school. Okay. We were focused on being able to speak in English, uh, not that even like it's a, it's a second language, uh, but I had to be able to read the Quran and the Urdu language. And I was, I would, I would just not, not remember everything, whatever I was reading, but after one hour I would go outside and it's like, I would have a complete different sense uh, or lens around me. And I started seeing who my friends were. Hmm. And Allah allowed those friends to get filtered all away from me and Allah gave me something more pure. They're still my brothers. So I realized being alone, how important everything has to be connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I got the m- m- most, uh, you know, retaliation from family. Uh, I got, you know, friends, family members, but everything seemed worthless. So, you know, in this journey, Having that pain to realize or how Allah SWT gives you that pain. To be able to realize that nothing is worth it. Mm. Except what Allah SWT is going to give you and what is going to be attached with Him. So, and I, I think that, you, know, you never forget this. Of course. You never forget this. These, are, this, these the, are spiritual windows of opportunity. So even in trauma. So if you have a traumatic experience, whether it's a divorce or whether it's a relationship or whether it's health, whatever it can be. Traumatic experiences, if you frame them properly, can be spiritual experiences. And what's very interesting is that 
you know, and we say this to people, stand in the possibility that the meaning you're giving this pain or trauma is not the only meaning. And what we usually say to people is, stand in the possibility that the correct meaning you're giving this trauma is the meaning that Allah and His Messenger wants you to give. This is like cognitive spiritual reframing, and you see this in the Quran when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks to the Prophet Sallam. The Prophet Sallam, his son passed away, and then Allah reveals Surah al kawthar <laughs> That is a that is a complete cognitive reframing reframing because mm. it talks about hey we've given you we've given you the abundance. Mm. Khalas. So now express gratitude for Salli li Rabbika wanha, right? Mm. Well, you have Surah Duha, you have even the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks to Musa alayhi salam, talking mm. about his past. We did this, we did that, we inspired this. To get you to cognitively and spiritually reframe your trauma, your experiences, and the way that Allah wants you to see them. And this is very interesting. There is a book by Viktor Frankl. He was a Holocaust survivor. It's called Man's Ultimate Search for Meaning. He actually, I think, almost thanks the Nazis. Mm. He says, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have meaning. I wouldn't have, you know... Uh, this sense of purpose and he made a very beautiful point saying that you can tra transcend your suffering if you give the right meaning to your suffering something like that so when people have these experiences their win the spiritual windows of opportunity and if you give it the right meaning at that time mm. something happens mm. and that's why when we say to people who even you know if they're muslim but they've moved away from islam we say, look, you've had these experiences. They're negative. We're empathizing. We're not saying that, oh, you didn't have them. We're not dismissing that. What we're saying is, is stand in the possibility that the meaning you're giving it right now is not the only meaning. If you could, I'm not even saying adopt it. Just stand in the possibility. Mm. Once you stand in the possibility and in, you even entertain the argument or the fact that the meaning that Allah wants you to give it is the right meaning, that's when something changes sometimes. Mm. So yeah, I mean... How did you deal with people who gave you a backlash? That's interesting. Like when you were going through your journey and did your, did the same, fr same, same friends remain with you or did they move away from you? I, my friend circle was uh, mostly from the uh, musician's background. Some of them uh, st still are part of the Coke studio, uh, you know, organizing committee. And uh, of course, uh, Allah filters that friendship. But now those friends who are maybe uh, the top notch DJ in a club in Dubai, they t do contact me. Like, although uh, we're taking all sorts of drugs, we drink alcohol every day, but we appreciate the kind of work that you're doing. Uh, and those friends that who were actually mocking you, maybe you know, f making fun of you, uh, I think they're mocking and me knowing for a fact that they do not enjoy my company made me realize that my heart was now thirsty for something else. Mm. And that element, that gap, I cut myself off. Like you see in Surah Al-Kahf, wow, Allah SWT gave those youngsters the cave. My cave was being able to get myself attached in books and uh, being alone. If my family was giving me hard time, I stayed consistent with it. I know for a fact that my masjid right in front of my house was just like, you know, right in front of the gate. And there was an entire opposition from my family because they feared for the fact that maybe I just going to leave uh, this whole... Uh, education and everything and maybe I'm brain or something but I stayed consistent although it was hurtful it was uh, it was a challenge but I think I told myself that maybe Allah wants me to understand that if I can get uh, opposition from family maybe when I share this with people outside I'd be more uh, stronger in terms of taking their uh, opposition because like somebody said that maybe you take care of other people because there is a part in you, inside you, which wanted uh, someone to take care of you and you didn't get that. Mm. And uh, the way, that's the very reason why it allows you to be able to get in the field of Dawah. Because when you wanted, because I did not have books, we didn't have books, we didn't have YouTube channels, we didn't have back in the day of 2002, 2003, yes, of right? Yes. My family wouldn't give me the car. I would actually go to the Institute of Dr. Star and be able to, you know, take a bus, read a book halfway there, come uh, like one hour uh, uh, thing and you do those buses are not in good condition. So we, I would do that. I would just walk all the way there. And my time was being alone and being able to be on that journey. Mm. And all of a sudden when the time was right, all of a sudden, I, was, I remember I was sitting in the cafeteria again because my people, my non-Muslim friends would be like, no, he started keeping a beard. Now, all, all, all of a sudden, he's going to be talking about religion because that's what I was thirsty about. 
and they would not they would be talking about drugs i won't be talking about that i would see it as an opportunity to talk about religion because now sharing that happiness was what was important for me la you min ahadukum hatta yuhibbu li akhi ma yuhibbu li nafsi you can't be able to reach that sweetness of iman if you don't you know love for your muslim brothers what you would love for your self and allah made me uh, you know he gave me those individuals and suddenly they started approaching me oh uh, i've said you know you've been able to uh, talk about religion this is whole change you're going on is it confirmed uh, let's just go for a tea and you know these big brothers are still part of the dawa and mm. st- slowly slowly how i did was be able to ha- you know get that an- energy in my cave i started doing dawa I started being able to fulfill that empty bucket with that old effort of being able to uh, do something for Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala which made it meaningless for me to be able to uh, get sad over those that opposition and uh, I started make uh, uh, developing a society I started inviting speakers I started inviting uh, team members uh, although they started backing off you know we have all that journey that journey was something which made me realize again that everything was given to me by allah mm. and it's this gift that allah has given me i didn't ask for it and he gave it to me and he can take it from me whenever he wants to absolutely and uh, what i need to be able to do is be able to uh since i've realized that this is everything is temporary i need to be able to make an effort for what is permanent mm. and i know that everything is going to and i heard somebody and one of the speaker is was a profound statement i'd still quote it i said you know if your friends hang out with you because they're having fun with you they're going to leave you the moment they stop going to have fun with you but if they meet you for the sake of allah then allah is going to be there forever and your friendship is going to be the forever absolutely and yawma yafirru almar'u min akhihi wa ummi wa abi wa sahibati wa bani that everybody is going to be running away, away from you except for those who are going to be for the sake of Allah. I said like why not have them? Why not have that source of energy around me to be able to motivate me to be able to go for Allah Subhanahu. One thing which allowed me was knowledge. I just made that of I still remember when I was sitting with in the masjid with one of my teachers who was, was a graduate from Madina University. I said I just want to be able to leave this computer science background. I just don't find it and it uh, in, you know worthy anymore. And it's like wait. You can serve Islam much in a much better way by doing all this all together and i know for these 5 6 years i was doing my two masters together and at the same time i was doing my 8 years uh, islamic scholarship at, at the same time wow and i would go for like 9 to 12 one paper and then 2 to 5 another paper and people would be like not finding it not possible it's like i'm just going to do it because i know for a fact that maybe i'm not going to get a lot of money from it but i know that this is what i need to do to be able to make me myself worthy in the sight of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala i have nothing i'm if you look ask me right now hamza i am a worthless individual if you look at it in terms of skills in terms of anything allah gave me this identity hamza otherwise i'm just an individual who is getting into fights and gang fights and oh, what man i don't want to talk about it i would have been dead by now I would have been like a, you know be a worthless individual nobody would remember but Allah gave me that identity I realized that my existence is of importance when I am uh, connected to Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala and all of a sudden and it was all from Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala I don't even how to put it in words and that's what made me feel important and I was I, there were time I was with all kind of kind of groups and I had like all these questions and it was a journey and those that journey although it was alone but it actually it was with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mm. and uh, i think that and, and everybody has that kind of journey right yes they've been through that but i i keep telling the youngsters if you get this opportunity to be alone and you feel that everybody is leaving you take it as an opportunity to be able to build your relationship with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he controls the heavens and the earth and he will give you what is better and you just have to be a little patient Absolutely. And it's interesting you mentioned about Dao cuz I remember when I first became Muslim I had a issue between is being convinced in Islam and my heart submitting to Islam. It was a massive issue for me actually to the point I used to make dua in sajda and say to Allah ya Allah something like I'm convinced but can you like bring my heart to this, yeah? It was a massive challenge and I remember I met an uncle on the bus 
I have no idea who he is. An old uncle, Asian, most likely Pakistani. I'm on the bus in London. I think it was in Hackney, where I'm from. And we were just talking. I think he realized I was a Muslim. Mm. We had a bit of a conversation. And I asked him a question. How do you bring your heart to what you believe? Do you know what he said to me? He said, give dawah. He said, if you throw the ball, it's going to bounce back. You throw the ball on the wall, it's going to bounce back. And that stayed with me. true. So true. Because you, I always say to people, if you're not giving dawah, someone's mm. giving dawah to you. Dawah is like a shield in a way. Mm. And maybe that uncle's one statement has drastically changed my entire life. True. It's one statement. I don't know his name. Mm. I don't know who he is. I don't remember his face. I just know he was quite elderly mm. to the point where he was praying, sitting down on the bus from what I remember. It was, you know, it's phenomenal. It's so one what, random individual changing the entire perspective. Of course. Like, that's why we have to be very careful mm. with what we say. Yeah. Sometimes I get a bit of anxiety. Like, even when we were talking now, I was thinking, oh, what I said, is that completely accurate? Let me think. And then you get waswasa and you, and sometimes I learned to ignore it now, yeah? Because, yani, it's shaitan trying to put you down, yeah? But you get a sense of anxiety in terms of, are you saying the right thing in the right way? Mm. How are people going to perceive it? How are they going to take it? How are they going to internalize it? How is it going to impact them? This is a huge thing. It's a massive thing. Obviously, earlier in the dawa, we were le- I was less conscious about those things, but now I'm far more conscious about what I say. And you, you like mm. to put caveats and nuances and everything so people really understand what you're saying. Because mm. one of my great, greatest weaknesses is being misunderstood. Yeah. That's a that's that's a weakness I have. If someone's misunderstood me, I'm gonna try my best for them to understand me. Yeah, true. So, yes, yeah, so it's very powerful what you said about the dawa thing because it, rem- it reminded me of what that mm. uncle said. You know, throw the ball; it's gonna bounce back. And that is quite interesting, even from a cognitive science perspective or whatever. When you behave, you become right when you change your actions you you that's what transforms you because there's like three main things that create transformation it's not actually intellect really mm. it's your language how you speak how you frame things it's your emotions and it's your body language mm. and your behaviors if you could change any one of those three things you're going to get some transformations none of that is intellectual mm. <laughs> none of that mm. like you could read a book and I, that's why i say to you and you asked a question about scholarship or learning you know, for the majority of my dawah, I was just book read and not even Islamic books or videos from mm. philosophers or all that nonsense. Yeah. What I realized in that journey that got me a little bit more serious concerning staying in my lane and being a scholastic t- in certain issues, mm. or maybe scholastic is the wrong word to use, being more focused on learning important mm. things concerning the deen is this understanding that states of being give rise to states of being. So if I want to learn to be humble, I'm not going to learn it from a book. You may get something, a little bit of a tinge or a taste from the book. But if you want to learn to be humble, you have to be around humble people. You have to be around humble scholars that show you through their way of being on how to be humble. And the whole learning process is in order for it to transform you, you have to understand that learning is not just memorization or learning an argument. True. Because what is ilm? Ilm, as there's two narrations attributed to Imam Malik concerning this notion of ilm. And he basically said it's not just memorization. Memorization is significant and very important for learning, mm-hmm. but it's not the complete picture. True. It's like the key. Mm. And he also argues that ilm is like a light that Allah puts in your heart. It's a nur. Mm. And this echoes the Quranic discourse concerning what is ilm. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when Allah says, is the one who knows like the one who doesn't know, what is the ayah before that? Allah talks about those who do sajda, they stand in prayer, mm. they have hope in the mercy of their Lord, they fear their judgment. It's, it affects their qalb. They mm. have taqwa. Allah says people of ilm are people of taqwa, right? Mm. So they... It, the, one of our crises in the modern day is that we think ilm is just reading a book and a couple of hadith. Wallahi, we can know all of the ayat on, on, on dhikr. Mm. We can know all of the hadith on dhikr, mm. but it will never make you a person of dhikr. Mm. Something else has to happen. There needs to be this kind of 
transformational mm. learning not just informational mm. not informative but transformative how that happens i am a strong believer in following obviously the quran and the sunnah with regards to tazkiyatun nafs tazkiyatun nafs allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears 11 times in the quran for only one topic in one go allah makes 11 oaths for mm. only one topic and that is the one who purifies his, his mm. soul succeeds mm. allah says you're not going to be safe on the day of judgment unless you come to allah with qalbin salim, qalbin salim. How do we deal with that? Hmm. How do we recognize and have self accountability to find out, you know, where's where is where is my heart on this issue? Hmm. How is my ikhlas? Do I have riya? Do I have ujub? Do I have vanity? Do I have kibber? Do I have hmm. arrogance? And all of these things. Do I have hasad? Why is that the case? Hmm. And one of the main solutions in dealing with that is having good people around you. True. Like generally speaking, the scholars of Tazkirat al Nas would say. There are many things to do, but mm. one thing to do, you need to focus on your environment. You're mm. going to be a product of your environment. True. And the greatest environment to be in is with learned brothers and with scholars, or at least students of knowledge mm. that you could just sit and learn from. Yeah, And you could see that, that the way of being is pious. And then that would, that, would, that would evoke that within you as well. Like, for example, mm. when I was, uh, I was studying this very short tafsir um, of, I think it was Surah Yusuf or Surah Rahman with a scholar. That scholar was held to account publicly and corrected. The way he took that correction and the way he absorbed it, owned it, it was transformative. Transformative. Mm -hmm. So you learn humility through those interactions, right? You can't learn that in a book. Maybe you read a story, but when you, this, that's more like ilm al yaqeen. This was haq al yaqeen. Mm -hmm. And it was ayn al yaqeen as well. Mm -hmm. I saw it and I experienced it, yeah? I saw it with my own eyes and, I, and, I, and it consumed me as well. And that would transform you to a certain degree. So the point I'm trying to make here is we need to bridge the gap between abstract knowing and becoming. Because what mm. is Iman, really? Iman is what you say, is what's in your heart and what's in your limbs. Mm. That's a way of being. Mm. Yeah, That's a way of being. How you, And to be is to be related. We're not human doings, we're human beings. So you relate. To be is to be related. So how you relate to yourself, how you relate to others, and how you relate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the things that you say and what's in your heart. So those things hopefully can be transformed if you first make a distinction. There is a difference between information and, and actually role learning. Mm. And even if you have that focus, something will happen. And you focus on your heart. Because remember, your heart, if it's hard, you, you can't plant a seed on a rock. So you need that. Hmm. Softness in the heart Which is done by Having the right people around you hmm. Engaging in dhikr in the morning and the evening hmm. As per the sunnah of the Prophet Sallam Tadabbar of the Quran Allah says do they not reflect upon the Quran On the locks on their hearts You can mirror the meaning The more tadabbar you do The more your heart becomes unlocked To receive his guidance and mercy And so on and so forth So your heart has to be soft to a certain degree So when ilm comes hmm. The seed comes Then it can grow hmm. But if it's a rock hmm. Do you see my point? Yeah I'm maybe I'm just waffling a bit, but I'm no, trying no. to I'm trying to get people to understand that yes, be on a path of knowledge, but make sure there is a maqsad to the knowledge, there is an objective to the knowledge which is actually transforming you, hmm. and it has to be transformational. And the way the one of the first ways to in, to ensure that it's transformational is number one, focus on your heart, work on your heart, and number two, make a distinction that there is a difference between information and transformation. Mm. And number three, have right people around you True. and engage with scholars because mm. their way of being will, will evoke something within you. And that's why I always say, you will learn from a scholar what you will never learn from a book. Mm. And uh, if you look at the important things which scholars actually uh, suggest, is to be not just with scholars, but uh, Ulama Rabbani, mm. uh, who actually are uh, good at you know nourishing uh, their students and training them to be able to give them the right kind of guidance who are That's actually Arabia. acting upon what they're teaching. And students can actually see this. And uh, uh, I've seen the love of uh, scholars when I've been to Medina and uh, how the scholars have been you know able to show their love to the students. You cannot just teach them the book and build a relationship with them. You mm. have to be able to you know, build that relationship. That is what Tarabiya is about. Parents can not just finance their kids, just make them have kids, but they have to be able to build that relationship. This relationship is very important even in this world. And also to al allow them uh, the, the seed to have that environment, to be able to nourish in that environment. Absolutely. 
and also give them the right feed, the, the, the water, and that's knowledge, the right, right kind of environment. And if you look at a, every individual who has been able to go through the change, he has been able to have the right kind of, even if one friend, mm. the right kind of environment, the right kind of individual to uh, be able to allow them to grow, to have the uh, knowledge, to learn, to be able to have the right kind of teachers, to be able to allow them to be able to stay inspired. Because the path of knowledge is not easy. Illa mashallah, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, you know, makes it easy for them. This is the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it in the Quran. This like, like you mentioned it. Inna fi zalika li zikra li man kana lahu qalbun aw al kasama fa wa shaheed. That this book is guidance for those who have a heart. Everybody mm. has a heart. Mm. But those who are able to hear, that they have an ear, but they are able to have to see. Uh, you know, the, the idea to, and because this the deen is not just about receiving information. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa received it from Jibreel alayhi wa it was like passed on to his heart and Rasulullah passed it on to his heart to towards the hearts of the, uh, the Sahaba yes. and so on. So if you're not, you're just getting that road learning element, if you're not having that thing passed to you through the heart, if you, you can actually see, like I teach the students and they're like, why are you so passionate about it when you're teaching in class? It's like, because I love doing it. I love connecting with you. I enjoy when you ask me questions. I'm just, if I'm going to just going to stick with the syllabus, I'm just going to lose that entire essence. So I think that's very important for you and even those who are maybe above 40, it's always important for you to be able to have that light inside your life, to be able to have your private circles, be able to you know use them as your source of energy. Your private gatherings, your, not just gathering, your private times are very important. Mm -hmm. How you utilize them, how you, you build your relationship with the Quran. And uh, it's, it's important for dua to be able to be inspired because uh, when I see when I uh, social media when I'm there for even on Twitter or Instagram for 15 minutes, it does put its effect on me. It's like maybe what, what I'm doing is not right. Maybe I need to change my strategy. And uh, that's the only thing that can save us. But like, uh, again, uh, just a few random questions just to be able to change the mood. Yeah, of course. Uh, you've been able to, uh, like this is your third time in Pakistan? Fourth. I Fourth think. time in yeah. Pakistan. A favorite city. Favorite city? Favorite city. Ooh. It's very difficult. I'm, I'm, the, the, no, I'm, I'm just like, okay, my, where have you been able to enjoy the most or be able to have that feel? That's, that's quite difficult to answer, to be honest. <laughs> it is difficult to Karachi, answer. Karachi, Lahore, Islamabad. Well, I mean, every experience is a unique experience. So in in, in February, I was in Lahore most of the time, yeah. I think. You started from Lahore, right? Yes, we had, yeah. the, the vision, we had the visionaries. Yeah. And then we did a podcast. We did loads of lectures and it was very busy. That mm. Every time I've been in Pakistan, it's been very busy. Yeah. I think it's a Pakistani thing. Yeah. They just want to squeeze not only the blood, bro. They want to take your bone marrow. <laughs> <laughs> so... Alhamdulillah, it's all worth it. So I don't know. I don't know how to answer that question. I any mean, city which starts with K, any. <laughs> <laughs> Karachi is nice because yeah. the food in Karachi is yeah. nice. Yeah. I was. So, that's my second question. Yeah, the food Karachi the is nice. Which is your favorite? Like, which favorite food in Karachi or like not Pakistan? Did well, I've had good Karachi? experiences in Karachi, yeah. but also Lahore is good. As Lahore well. is like, good. like for example, the Chinese restaurants yeah. are quite good. Okay. I have to admit. Are you into like spicy food? I could do yeah. bits of everything, really. Okay. I'm, I'm easy. I can have steaks. I can have bland food. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I'm not a foodie guy, okay. but I can eat mostly anything. Alhamdulillah. But I try and be healthy now, yeah? Yeah. Good. So, I don't, it's, you know, you know, when people ask me these questions, it's really weird because I am cognizant of the fact that my answers sometimes are dependent on my mood. Yeah. So at the moment, I'm chilled. My wife would ask, does this look good on me? So yeah, it looks amazing or whatever. And then next week I'm like, why are you wearing that? <laughs> whatever. So, you know, in the context of home clothes, of course, yeah. So when you ask the question, like, what is your favorite city? I'm not I'm not saying I'm panicking, but yeah. I'm like, well, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Because I am cognizant of the fact that mm. you know the way we perceive the past yeah. is sometimes through the present emotions. Mm. Is this too deep for like? No, no, <laughs> no, no that's fine. I'm sorry. I, I believe you've had division. Look, the whole look, let me tell you about Pakistan, yeah? I truly believe that Pakistan could lead the world. Easy. I know there's poverty, there's structural issues, there's mm. so much going on, right? But the potential that I've seen in Pakistan, the spirituality I've seen in Pakistan, the type of people I've met in Pakistan, 
the money that's in Pakistan, people with vision in Pakistan, it's like subtle changes need to be made and something is going to happen. Mm. I really, and that's why this is my fourth time here. Mm. I was here just in February and mm. what I realized was happening in the university was like, okay, we need to do something about maybe liberalism, LGBTQ+, go to elite universities and we train some people, connect with the other organizations, Youth Club, Live Dean, Orange, Orange Tree Foundation, which is amazing. It's happened. Mm. And, you know, to plant the seeds and to touch, move and inspire people, to plant the seeds in the hearts and minds of people so they could continue their intellectual and spiritual journey. Like I did a workshop around from like 9.30 to 1.30 on mm. the isms trap, liberalism, atheism, LGBTQ+, to get people thinking and to get them to start maybe moving forward on how they could produce certain actions or deliverables in mm. order to actually support and maintain our narrative and the Tao and so on and so forth. And I felt that was needed. That's why I wanted to come back. It's really needed because you know why? Uh, because uh, people... And I don't, by the way, I just want to make a caveat. I don't want people to think that I'm coming all the way from the West thinking I'm a savior. I am not. And I actually, and I've said this publicly, um, especially about youth club, uh, they should take over sapiens. I'm more than willing for them to take over sapiens. Mm -hmm. Youth club are amazing. But I do appreciate that coming from the West and being engaged in the secular philosophical academic studies and actually providing a certain perspective supports the existing brothers on the ground. Yeah. So I see myself as part of the, the bricks that is mm. building that strong mm. house of Islam in the country. I don't want people to think that I'm coming here. I know I don't. Mm. I was asked a question about something. I said, this is not my urf. It's not my custom. Mm. It's I don't know the culture that well. Ask mm. a scholar. Mm. So I want people to realize because that shaitan, not shaitan, but that, that can happen in someone's mind. Who does Hamza think he is? And True. I would say that as well. Mm. But I am very cognizant of the fact mm. that the reason I brought all the organizations together is because it's a team effort. True. And if me coming here and there is supportive, mm. I would do it. Mm. The minute I realize it's not supportive, I'll never come back. True. Do you see my point? So yeah. I want people to think yeah. that when it comes to the Tao, you should always do a mm. health check analysis if you if you have ikhlas. Yeah. What's a health check analysis? If something is working and it needs replicating, replicate it. Mm. If something is working and replicating is not good, don't replicate it. Support the existing thing, make dua and give it money. Mm. If another thing or a project or an entity, whatever their case may be, is unhealthy, mm. make it healthy. Mm. If you can't make it healthy, then replicate something else to actually mm. provide positive competition. If something, if there is a gap, fill the gap. Mm. What people do sometimes, they replicate things and it's not, it doesn't need replicating. And you, what you do, you just basically spread thin the necessary resources, yeah? Mm. And that for me is a sign of a lack of a vision. Mm. Because if the vision is Allah-centric, Akhara-centric, mm. and you really want to please Allah and ensure Allah's word is the highest and promote Islam, and it's all about the deen, it's all about Allah's pleasure, what is pleasing to Him the most in this particular context, mm. if you ask that question, then you won't be replicating things just for the sake of it. You'll be mm. thinking, okay, is me replicating this thing good for the Dawa or not good for the Dawa? Is it better that I use these resources to support the existing thing? Those questions need to be asked if you have a class, do you see? So I don't want people to think that, you know, I'm some kind of like, uh, you know, revert who's come here. But I do appreciate that being a revert, having the academic background that I have, having the experience that I have, and maybe the way I speak can provide a service. And my teaching skills for certain issues can help the existing brothers and the existing Tao that's happening in Pakistan. Um, and it does because past sucks, experience has yeah, been. Yeah. So I don't want people to think yeah. that you know, no, what you as, said if, is as if wise. nothing's happening here. Trust me, great work mm. is happening here. In actual fact, let's give credit to Youth Club. Youth Club are basically broke the bone, broke the backbone of the LGBTQ plus yes, of, 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 of mm. the ideology here, mm. smashed it. But we know, though, unfortunately, ideologies always want to. Uh, re give re uh, mm. they want to be reborn and they want to defend and propagate themselves and they're going to come back mm. because the funding is going to come this is going True. to come mm. so we always have to basically play that ideological chess game and know what we need to do so every drop raises the ocean so mm. every effort is very important even though we think that we've succeeded in something mm. you still don't be complacent mm. so things are going to happen mm. and there's going to be challenges to youth club and now youth club uh, was not much of a threat and now that they've been able to see us actively participate in all these things, now the idea of targeting youth club is basically yes. uh, from all angles. So it's a new phase. Uh, but but we were, what you said was pretty wise and I too, totally agree with it because previously we had a bad experience from 
international speakers okay uh in the in in terms of like rather than uniting people it was more about setting up your own ground oh really yeah and uh, this allowed the organization to start something on their own and uh, because if eventually because the idea is if, if we cannot you know be on the same platform fighting against uh, the common enemy uh then of course then it, the more divided we're going to be the more space they will have in order to be able to make their uh foundation so i think uh it's very important but the, the fact is that what you doing is very much needed over here because why people want answers uh they want a source from their whom which they trust who can actually come up and and i have a, a confession to me i was like speaking yes uh yesterday at the habit city and i have no uh you know hesitation in being able to say that all of a sudden i was like i've given several talks i've given uh, tons of talks and in the middle of the talk i was struck with this element of haya and uh, it's like you know, hamza is present right in front of me and i i think uh when somebody is there you know this is what i've learned from scholars that person who has more command or has more knowledge over something uh it's not suitable for you to be able to speak in that their presence and no no that yeah, was no, 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 that's complete, wallahi, wallahi, complete and nonsense and I, I, in the, in the in the in the middle in I mean, the complete in the, nonsense I was, concerning I was, me I was, i was telling this irzai the exact same thing <laughs> I was telling exactly the same thing. No, no, no. And you know, uh, it it once I, I you know I really uh, I was once in sitting right. Uh, I was attending one of my scholars, and this is one big uh, sheikh uh, in Pakistan who's like also one of my teacher. And I tried sitting in his class, and uh, this place was full. So he said, "Come and sit next to me." Yo, I was like not able to even feel that I was able to breathe very comfortably because I was sitting next to him. It's a problem. This is like. how it is so i've seen scholars being able to you know get up from uh, the, because they respect one another but there shouldn't be like ma- um, ma- mashallah you have that command and people do understand that and they need a trusted source and uh, uh, our mission is to be able to collaborate with you so that people know that we exist yes of course and so that we get more platform to be able to uh, do the uh, and what i found with this as well is that many organizations may get new audiences like for example today i was at live dean's event hmm. around 30 to 40% have never attended a live dean yeah. event before yeah. do you see so it brings people together it shows a ummatic unity from all around the world but also i may be able to access a university that a youth club may be banned from hmm. for example yeah? yeah i don't know if you're allowed in lums You may, uh, we, you may uh, be or may not be, but well, for exa- but yeah, like recently yeah, they make recently, it difficult. Yeah, it would make it very difficult. Yeah. I heard what they were doing with the stupid yeah. things that they were doing here. Dory, I'll I'm, I have your back. I'm I'm Inshallah. there. I'm there next week. Inshallah. Yeah. So I'm going to be talking about secular ethics versus Islamic ethics. Mm. Yeah, and I'll throw a few things in there. Don't worry. So I may be able to access institutions that brothers on the ground can't because they've mm. created certain noise amongst the community. Good noise. Mm. So we're all supporting each other. Do you mm. see? Um, and I find it a, a, a extremely distasteful for people coming outside of the country saying, "Well, I'm going to establish something." No, the whole point was: is can we, uh, me as an individual, and us as sapiens, can we support existing structures, organizations, and narratives on the ground, and would it provide an impact? If it's yes, then we'll do it, and we'll support them, and we'll promote them. Like mm. yesterday, when I said everyone should fund youth club, support youth club. that's our narrative mm. and the reason i'm mentioning this is not to just come across as some kind of fake humility to get people to realize this is the way the dao should be happening mm. it should be coming together with different organizations having a unified front um supporting them not coming over as if this is your place your domain but seeing if there are any gaps that you can fill fill them if there's anything you can enhance and hearts anything that you could replicate and support support and at the same time bring them back to the local ulama and bring them back to local organizations mm. that's significant and that's what should happen so that's why I'm very happy that I'm here again and that's why I wanted to focus on workshops so we're doing lectures for sure to touch move and inspire people and create some noise and create that kind of intellectual spiritual energetic environment to facilitate mm. the work but We've, I think I've done already two workshops. One on like does science lead to atheism? Mm. We did this at in uh, Rabat. Uh, we did one today on the isms, on LGBTQ plus, on liberalism, on atheism. We're doing other stuff together in Islamabad as mm. well. It for it to be workshop and seminar related is better because it develops people. And uh, one of your brothers, our brothers, my brother, Nadim Ashraf, yeah. may Allah bless him. Yeah. He's a legend. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He made a really good point. He was like. 
Hamza, you need to do workshops. Forget this lecture, mm. showcasing show. And I agree. And that's why I got the, all the brothers, the organizers to actually focus on, we need to at least during the weekend, certain workshops and seminars to inspire people. So they, they start acting. Because sometimes if you think about it, when you look at the Dawa, it is a little bit like, mm. a, 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 you know, superstars and like, mm. it's, it's, it's complete nonsense, some of it, yeah? Mm. It's important, but we overemphasize the quick lectures, the quick talks. Ah, mm. oh, he's a great speaker. Yeah. No, the whole point is, especially our strategy at Sapiens is our vision is we see a world convinced of Islam. Mm. And our strategy is that we as a team will share Islam academically, intellectually and develop individuals and organizations to do the same. Hmm. That's part of our strategy. To empower other people to be able to do the same. Yes. Because a lot of people that's actually needed. attend sessions. It's too, like, because I, I, I feel I may be wrong. Uh, a lot of people are like, okay, fine. It makes me intellectual superior, intellectually superior. I feel that. But most of the time it's like the emperor new clothes kind of a thing. But hmm. at the end of the day, if you're leaving a session, you're not being empowered. You're not being able to teach other people regarding it. And the instructor has not been able to empower you to be able to teach others. Then I think it's going to be more of like a speaking session. Oh, good. I was just so impressed Agreed. with it. So I, I think that's what is needed. And you're so uh, right in saying that uh, if local people are going to be able to uh, be empowered and be able to carry on that aspect, what Sapiens is doing, what other organizations are doing, uh, it's actually going to be a huge amount of uh, Sadkai Jariya as well. Yeah, of course. Because of course, the like uh, you're here for a short period of time and local uh, individuals are here they'll be, because we have walk coming up. Uh, we're going to go to like, we actually covered more than 500 plus uh, universities and colleges all over wow. Pakistan last year. This time is, we plan to go bigger, inshallah. Wow. So we, we do that. And now inshallah. we have more speakers. We have a bigger team. We have uh, three offices in uh, cities. Uh, I cover the entire uh, Sindh along with my team. So uh, Alhamdulillah, what the, the unique thing about Youth Club is that we get new audience every time in our events. Brilliant. And each and every speaker have their own following. Like yes. Taha has more of a, like a very soft spoken speaking style. Uh, Muhammad Ali has more of a teaching. Mughira has more of like a uh, Ilmi uh, background. Ziyabai has more of a like, you know, yeah, different style. Mughira, every, yeah. all of these speakers are like, a, like we, we usually say this, keep on saying it's like, like a bouquet. Yeah. Each flower. Uh, They're all great brothers yeah, as well. Mashallah. I bet them. May Allah and save us, uh, each and every one of us. I mean, and all I mean, other I mean. organizations as well. And it's very important that we get empowered to be able to. And this is what the very thing I uh, spoke of with Youth Club. And they're saying we should invite uh, more of the international speakers. Like, yes, that that will be good. But up till now, no organization has been able to empower and create an identity of the local uh, speakers over here. 100%. I think Youth Club needs to do that. And then when they could, are able to sit at the same level as international speakers, we will be able to have that element because at, at the end of the day, you do understand how the Pakistani mentality works. Anything coming from abroad is more appreciated rather than their own thing. Yeah. It's not that and I'm not- And you could I'm, use that to the advantage of yeah. the Dawah here. And I'm, I'm down yes. to the fact that they're not good. I'm not um, you know, uh, saying that the value is negative, but I think we need to be able to understand that more investment in terms of local Duat organization to 100%. be able to stay over here so that they know the circumstances and be able, and collaborating with uh, everyone. All, all I remember when we came here about 13 years ago, the Lums debate. Yeah, that time. And when the first winds of change, I think, or even before then, mm. before Youth Club started. Mm. And Ziabai, he was driving us everywhere. He, and, you know, bona fide. Ziabai was recording the Lums session. He, he, was, was, he was the cameraman. He yeah. was a camera guy. He was the driver. He was so humble. He was a scholar, lecturer, student of knowledge. And he was taking us, miskin, yeah, from an Ilmi perspective, especially that time. The humility there was something else, yeah. May Allah bless him. And I remember saying, I don't want to come back again. I, I said, I don't want to come back to Pakistan again. Not because I don't love the country, it's because I, I, we, even from that time, we had the mindset of people need to develop themselves and develop homegrown people to make an impact. Mm. And when international brothers come, they do it to support the existing structure, mm. the ex existing narratives, fill any gaps if there are gaps, replicate if needed to be replicated or enhance if needed to enhance and stuff like that. It should be part of a local strategy. Yeah, <coughs> That's why all these three organizations, but I think for Pakistan, it's quite good for organizations to come together. Mm. I know it's difficult, but it happened. And I was really happy, Orange, Orange Tree, Live Dean, Youth Club, different cities coming mm. together to actually engage, not just to do lectures, but to do workshops, to mm. empower and develop mm. people. 
so yeah, that was a long kind of hmm. reaction to, you know, that potential whispering people may have. But I don't want people to think like that because they need to support the existing people on the ground and they need to understand that they need to be developed to support Pakistan with regards to the dawah and the challenges that it faces from liberalism and mm. humanism and atheism and unfortunately and one thing that did that did motivate me actually when i was here in february when i went to the elite universities the uh, the liberal arts university I went to lums went to this place that place i noticed there was even an increased kind of impact sorry increased effort to liberalize and secularize and damage the hearts and minds of middle class and elite students mm. And these are the future leaders of Pakistan. Now, in a way, that's good news. Why? Because it means that the existing organizations like Youth have done a good job because they wouldn't be pre put more pressure, mm. right? Do you see my point? I'm thinking that that's a good job, but they also, I think we need to uh, enhance the focus because they're going to come and attack you guys now. Mm. Yeah. It's going to come. It's inevitable. Yeah? And you need to be prepared for that. Imagine and we have, have your back. We have your back. The we'll LGBT support you all community, the way. LGBT community in Pakistan held a protest outside. And they had our organization's name on their banner. SubhanAllah. I think that's an achievement for us. Absolutely. Because you consider us a threat now. It's this a, means we're doing something. Like in a, a said, ba badge of honor. See where the arrows are being pointed. <laughs> the enemies Subhanallah. Are, Subhanallah. Said, Alhamdulillah, and we would want our efforts to grow because, of course, we have plans. Alhamdulillah, uh, not just for Pakistan, but inshallah, Allah abroad. And uh, it's not just us doing the work, but wherever it is needed, like you said, with all the brothers. And at the end of the day, we might be working in terms of sapiens, in terms uh, of Adhan tribe, uh, Live Dean, uh, Orange Tree Foundation, any other. There's several organizations over here, youth club, where at the end of the day, uh, we are working for the same cause and in any way possible we need to strengthen ourselves empower us be able to have those necessary skills we're still learning we keep on learning to be able to face the common enemy uh, all those isms all those elements in terms of anything uh, uh inshallah and this is why uh, i keep talking about this in the shura whenever the uh, management is there the the shura members are there in youth club i say you know uh, we need to not be able to limit ourselves and never think that you uh, have don't have that ability to be able to not be able to go abroad. And we've, inshallah, ta'ala, trying to be able to make those tours as well. Uh, we had a, a, a invitation from Australia. Ziyabai went to uh, several places. UK sessions we're already doing uh, with the help of Nadim Bhai. So inshallah, ta'ala, we, we, but our main focus is like has to be Pakistan. Uh, because where we are, we need to, because our audience is those younger generation who are being put, their minds are being pulled like anything, not just the minds, but the hearts. Yes. And uh, they just, the, the education institutes are not doing their mm. uh, fulfilling. Their so in a nutshell, you should use international speakers as tools if needed. If you think they'll make an impact, you invite them. I don't think it should be used as a strategy because some people do that. They just bring international speakers, they go home, they're here for a few days, they, they go for a few days and they go back home hmm. and there's nothing on the ground. Hmm. So I think the strategy that Youth Club have adopted for the past decade or more has been one of the best workable strategies that's happened I'm is there. developing the brothers on the ground. You guys are more popular than the international speakers anyway. Are we? Yeah, what, like a million subscribers? How many people have a million subscribers, bro? Come on. Far more popular. Um, have, have made a greater impact locally. Some of these brothers haven't had the same local impact in their own countries. Alhamdulillah. I'm being very serious mm. here, yeah? The marketing, the ilm as well. You're all bona fide, either a Molana or a student of knowledge or a sheikh. It's, you know, I know you guys are hench and <laughs> do this do that boxing cars <laughs> whatever bikes but the point is you're the holistic package and that's why i was actually genuine when i said to zia i said listen you need to take over <laughs> you need to take over so you know what you guys don't have is, is, is this phenomenal mm -hmm. like increase it's, it's it and amazing. anything and anything that i can do or we can do to support and help you will always will always have your back Man, wherever true. you want us we're there front line middle line at the back we'll be supporting you mm. if you know, you want me to make noise at Lums, let me know, I'll be there as well. <laughs> That's great. So amazing. whatever you need, we're at your service. Because we're, we're, I want, and the beautiful thing is when these things happen is when they see many organizations together and they see different brothers from different countries together, mm -hmm. then they, and they see that it's being led by local organizations like Youth Club. They're like, wow, this is not just a Pakistani thing. 
It's an ummah thing. Mm. Yeah, that's the other benefit to this as well. It creates that kind of inspiration. Mm. But anyway, Jen. look, Jazakallah for having me well, here. Man, I miss uh, you. Last, your uh, hope from Pakistan. Where do you see Pakistan and what do you expect from Pakistan? Inshallah. You know, in terms of like, yes, uh, the, 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 the issues are there. Uh, but uh, in terms of uh, religious work, in terms of being able to uh, create an impact with regards to religion, uh, what are the key strengths that you see in Pakistan? And uh, where do you see them in, in future, inshallah? Yeah, I mean, I see the key strengths of Pakistan is they definitely have the passion and the love for the deen. Even people who are not practicing have love for the deen. Yeah, it's just something within them. It's in your spiritual, political, economic, social DNA. It's part of who you are. Yes, there are challenges. You have the secular elites. You have some of the atheists. You have some of the liberals, for sure. You have a huge population that may be even ignorant about mm. the key tenets of Islam. But what I've seen so far with the different organizations and the brothers, the middle classes, if mm. you like, those who are also educated, connected to the deen, the practicing community, if there are structural changes in this country, you guys could take over the world. Sure. Like, I, like, I'm like not joking. Like, yani, this is, there is so much in Pakistan, it's unbelievable. Mm. Because you have the ilm, you have the scholarship, you have even the money. There are many wealthy people in this country, many wealthy practicing people in this country. You have the passion, you have the love for the deen. Mm. You have even the understanding of marketing and all of these things. You also have a grounding in the secular sciences, philosophy, all of these political sciences, ideologies. All you need is this like a few inches, a few structural changes and mm. something's going to happen. And mm. I really believe that. And that's why all eyes on Pakistan. The whole ummah should support Pakistan. The whole ummah should even externally, and I did this in Ramadan, I, I was doing a fundraising with Youth Club. People should support Youth Club from abroad. Absolutely. And I even said to them, you'd get more bang for your buck because of the exchange. Yeah. Mm. If you give $1,000 right, to Youth Club, that will go further than giving $1,000 to a local organization there. Mm. Don't get me wrong, support them too. Mm. You know, Allah's bounty is infinite. We're not going to restrict it. True. But the point is, if you really want to be strategic with your sadaqah, those people listening from abroad, your $1,000 or £1,000, if you give it to Youth Club, will go far more, True. far greater than any True. other country. And this is the place to be. All eyes on Pakistan. Because if you have all of these ideologues, these kufri ideologues, really trying to feed off Pakistan, it means they know the potential of Pakistan. Hmm. They haven't let Pakistan, they haven't let, left it alone. You got the LGBTQ+, you got the liberals, you got the atheists, you got the humanists, you got the secularists, you got everybody here, even coming with money. And as you said yesterday, someone trying to sponsor an influencer to try and, you know, push certain kufri narratives. It's all happening here. Why? Because they see something they see, and yeah. you better see it before yeah. uh, anything else happens, that True. they see yeah. huge potential. True. So, brothers and sisters, where's the camera? Fundraising, USA, Canada, rich people, middle class, even if you're poor, your 100 pounds will go further further here than it would in the UK. Support them too. But from a global, omatic perspective, things are happening here. Mm. Support Pakistan. Go to Youth Club. What's the website? Youthclub.pk Youthclub.pk Give your money. And I'm telling you, get more bang for your buck. And I trust the brothers. I'll take a thousand bullets for them. And uh, trust me, the money will go further. And you see in their work with the marketing, with the numbers that they have, 500 universities. 500 plus universities. But unbelievable. I don't think there is any speaker in the UK or group that's, had, that's attended 500 British universities. One day universities. we were actually covering, at least uh, all our speakers were covering more than 10, 15 colleges and universities in the same city. Uh, three speakers or four speakers Lower in the same city while we were somewhere co covering the northern Punjab somewhere covering the southern Punjab and then we had to come to Sindh and the, the Karachi and then interior Sindh and all over the world Mashallah. and social media was being stormed with all the uh, things and that's the marketing strategy that we are everywhere and people are like okay fine so Mashallah May Allah protect and preserve you and increase Thank you so much no, It's a pleasure having you here Likewise. and uh, the love you have for Pakistan the love you have for the Pakistan team and the love you have for you Youth club, um, it doesn't feel like we're speaking with you like for the first time. Exactly. And may Allah increase our love, and may Allah subhanahu wa taala allow our sins to be forgiven. I mean, uh, and Allah 
make he uh, allow us to be with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in Jannah inshallah. I mean, I mean. Uh, thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakumullah khair for watching this video. इस तरह के और मजीद वीडियोस पॉसिबल हो सकता है सिर्फ और सिर्फ आपकी सपोर्ट के साथ क्लिक ऑन द पेट्रियन लिंक एंड सपोर्ट अस नाउ